So I, I wanted to um, just give um, a political perspective and then what I might call a sociological one. I'll explain what I mean in a second. So as I said, uh, I used to do campaigning, lobbying and influencing of government. And uh, I also did a master's uh, in research looking at homeless le legislation uh, and why it got passed, what was going on in Parliament at the time, going right back to 1977 when the first legislation was passed. And then I've also got a PhD, uh, which is about um, institution, which, which I call sociology, but basically I'm talking about how people, in, people who are homeless interact with institutions and organisations. That's what I mean. That's all I mean by sociology. I want to be a bit bold and brave here. So this is why I'm speaking for myself, because I'm, I'm going to say what 25 years of work in the field and um, subsequent research has taught me. Um, and have a little look at what lies beneath some of the stuff that's on the surface level. Uh, and that's why I'm talking from a personal point of view. So I think the first thing I have to say is that there's a collective dishonesty that underlies all of this. And I've been complicit in it as much as everybody else. And what I mean by that is it starts with government and then it filters down to what I might call the wider homelessness world. So, for example, if we look at the policy agenda, Government put pressure on local authorities to get housing, households out of bed and breakfast and not to move and out of temporary accommodation and not to move them out of area. They say all of that. But then simultaneously, we know that policy decisions are making that almost impossible around things like LHA rates and so on. They also say government makes statements about making sure that the most vulnerable in society are helped and wanting to end rough sleeping and so on. Yet simultaneously, you've had things like loosening the connection between housing need and allocations. And there's an article in The Guardian today about the impact upon house building and the lack of it and uh, 40 years of right to buy and how that's led people into poor quality private rented accommodation as the only option to them. And so looking back in 1977, people might be interested to know that the legislation was a compromise then and legislation's always really been a compromise. Two of the things that stand out for me in about the 1977 legislation was firstly that the code of guidance was seen as really important. It was seen as the um, thing that was going to oil the wheels of the, of, the, of the slightly complex new legislation that was going to make sure that it worked in practice the way the way that Parliament intended. And the second thing was that priority need was never meant to be this permanent fixture. It, that was a, it was a compromise to do with the parliamentary uh, makeup at the time to, to get the legislation through. So it, was, so it was a compromise. And yet what happens is the reality of local authorities, are they caught in, they're caught in this bind, this political bind, where they can't meet their duty, whether you do that with a capital D or whether you mean their moral duty. And so what they do they can't help everyone is they find ways of not doing it and if i not helping people i think of you examples from my very practical examples from my years working in the field firstly um when i used to work in hostels for example the advice and assistance that was in statute that people were supposed to get could just consist of a photocopied list of hostels for people people to ring up and similarly um, when Pereira was struck down, like we were talking about earlier, or when it, when it was said that this was never what Parliament intended, I was around then and wrote the briefing for Homeless Link at the time I was working for. And that, that decision was used as a mechanism for rationing resources and not undertaking assessments. Um, so you've got this kind of real politique going on, the, count, the bind that councils are in. But at the same time, there's this pretense going on to government and in official documents that they're trying to implement the law. Whereas in cases like HOTAC, it became clear that they, that case law had been used as a set in a benchmark that nobody could ever get over. Um, which then brings me to the sociological side. So people who I interviewed for my research who'd been rough sleeping, they are, they are experiencing institutions that are operating in the way that I've just described. And the reality is that most of the people I interviewed felt that local authorities were trying to find reasons not to help them. Now, whether that's true or not, that was their impression. 
and that those case laws and those 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 decisions they were given were about closing slamming doors in their faces um and a series of hurdles that people feel they have to get over of being homeless and homeless being able to evidence and um, priority need and stuff around intentionality this takes place for the people i interviewed in a world where they are used to institutional rejection where they feel doors are shut in their faces anyway and so the first sign that this is going to happen again fulfills their expectation and they often walk away and the people ironically who are most well placed to get help from local authorities were the more functional the more eloquent those who understood how the system operated those who were able to sometimes get a charity like mike's or a lawyer like sarah to help with take up their cases but the people who were least likely to be able to access those that help were those for whom their life was focused on survival really and for people with trauma like i have life feels very dangerous i just want to give an analogy that i think is helpful in terms of this a few years ago i uh, i in, uh, i interviewed a lot of people who'd been in the armed forces and who'd ended up homeless and what we, what people talked to me about was in the armed forces you are told you are taught because you have to be to accept decisions that are made by other people without question you're giving orders basically i think the analogy is a good one because i think that people who are traumatized are used to people saying no and having control over their lives and them not being able to do anything about it and so the minute minute that those institutions put no in front of people's faces say to them we can't help you we're not going to help you you don't fit the criteria very hard for people to overcome that so I think what you have in conclusion is a rationing of resources, but a rationing of resources that does not reflect need, but more about people's ability to activate the system. Thanks. That's awesome, Paul. Thank you. I mean, so that for, for me, this kind of sets up the discussion now. So in one hand, Sarah's saying what the law is, and in one sense, Paul's saying what the reality is for people. Now, I would kind of add into this, as I, as I kind of said earlier, despite like resources shrinking for councils, there are always political choices that can be made. As I say, in Bedford, they managed to find money for it. So I think that's kind of where, in that sense, where, that's where we start to come in, and that's where actually why making strong applications and evidencing people are in priority need because of a range of issues is going to potentially or, or you know if you do it long enough it will make a difference and, and kind of isn't all doom and gloom 